So most of the of the what we've been discussing right now so far is we've been discussing the four categories of guardians. I'm either a paid guardian or I'm an unpaid guardian or I'm a borrower or I'm a renter. These are the four types of guardians. And then there are different claims. So for example, I'm an unpaid guardian. You asked me, you're going to Jerusalem. You asked me to, to watch, to guard your object, your, your, what do you have that you want me to guard? I don't know, your iPhone 14 or the new one, 15, I don't know, 16, whatever they're holding. And I say, okay, I'll take it. You're not paying me, so I have a limited liability, but okay. Then I have a claim. You come back and I make a claim. I say it was stolen. I say it was lost. I say it was, the tsunami washed it away. I have to make a claim. If I don't want to pay, I have to make a claim. And then we evaluate the claim. Some claims I'm liable for, some claims I'm not liable for. So that's clear. The Torah discusses that at some length. And we have a full tract in the in a full chapter in the Talmud um, discussing the laws of the guardians, more than one, more than one, more than one chapter. Now here's an interesting case. The interesting case is so Vicky's going out of town. She gives me her object to watch, to guard. Um, she comes back to pick it up and she says, Nu Menachem, how is my object? I say, it's wonderful. It's unbelievable. Never been better. No theft, no theft. Nobody broke it. No. Did you take it on a walk and it got lost? No, everything is fine. So can I have my money? Can I have my watch? I say, ah, I forgot where I put it. So now the question is, what happens? Yeah, I'm not making a claim that it was lost or stolen. I'm saying, I have it. It's no problem. Come back next week. I'm sure it will come up before pa Passover. When I search my house for Pesach, I'm sure I'll find it. But right now, I don't have it. Now, this is a very interesting case because nowhere in the Mishnah, nowhere in the Talmud, nowhere in the Torah, nowhere in the Mishnah even, which is the first we first recorded, first uh, um, um, written collection of Jewish law, does it, does it talk about this? And therefore, the Talmud just knows about this from a story. There's a story that this happened. Nobody ever thought it never happened before. So what's interesting here is I'm not really making a claim. I'm not saying that it was stolen or, or it got, I took it outside and it got lost. I say I have it. I just say I don't, have, I don't remember where I put it. Uh, Rabbi Darren said a funny joke the other Shabbos. He said that there was once upon a time, I don't know, that I, I'm not a golfer, so I can't tell you to repeat the joke with all the precise terms, but apparently one of the things you need to know on golf, you have to have a very good eyesight. So they had a team. And at some point, they say the, one of the team, one of the teammates moved out of town. We have to we have to find another teammate. So they said there's one guy who's 105 years old and he has phenomenal eyesight. Nobody has eyesight as good as this guy. They say really 105 and he has good eyesight. Yeah, 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 wonderful eyesight. So they get get him to play the team, and somebody hits the ball again. I don't know anything about golf. The bottom line is they say, Yankel. I know you're 105. Did you see where the ball went? Nobody could see where the ball went. He says, do you see where the ball went? Yeah, yeah, I see the ball went. Are you sure you can see? Amazing. You're 105. You can see where the ball went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see where the ball went. So where's the ball? He says, I forgot. So his eyesight is good, but his memory is a problematic. So that's what's happening over here. There's no problem. The ob object wasn't lost. The object wasn't stolen. You came to my house. You asked me to guard your item. I put it where I was supposed to. It's in my house somewhere. I can't find it. Uh, um, what what do I do? So we'll read the we'll, re, we'll read the Tom, Talmudic story. Talmudic story gets a little complicated, um, but we'll read the Talmudic story and then we'll get back to Maimonides and then we'll start getting into the post Talmudic commentaries, which start now analyzing. So that that will be that will be the first our first our first uh, um, item on today's agenda, and we'll see what happens from there. Okay, so I'm looking at. Um, where are we? Ahu Gabra, there's a story. A certain man, Aramaic Ahu Gabra, there was this person. When we were kids, they would say a joke that you go to Israel and, um, you know, the tour guides are always telling you every, under every rock, there was a historic event. Under this rock, this happened and this happened there. And there everything, there's so much history in the land of Israel. So the joke is that the tour guide points to a certain direction and he says, you know, the famous guy, Ahu Gavra from the Talmud, he's buried right there. Of course, Ahu Gavra is John Doe, you know, the guy. So that was the joke in the third grade. In any case, the Gemara relates, a certain man deposited jewels with another. He's going out of town. There's no, there's no banks. There's no safe deposit box. You don't want your jewels to get lost. You ask your neighbor to hold it for you. When the period of the deposit was complete, 
The owner of the jewels said to the Bailey, came to the guardian, give me the jewels. Could you pay them back to me? The Bailey sent to him in response, I do not know where I placed them. In other words, he's not saying it was lost. He's not saying it was stolen. He's saying, I forgot where I put it, but it's in my house. It's somewhere. The guy says, pay me for them. He says, pay you. I don't have money. I don't have to pay you. There's nothing happened. Wait a minute. Wait a week. Wait a day. Wait, wait, wait a month. I'm sure I'll find it. So what do you do? So they came, the matter came. Okay, let's stop right here. What do you think? Anybody wants to jump in and say what they think? What should we do? <laughs> I think there is a time frame issue. You have to you have to set a certain time frame. Okay, very good. Very good. Because you have been, to come up with it with this reasonable period of time. I don't know what it is. And you mentally capable, then there is <laughs> you're not like the guy who's a who, the guy for my joke. Well, okay. he may be capable. <laughs> I'm very happy you said that because the one thing the Talmud doesn't say is the Talmud doesn't give a time frame, doesn't say anything about time. And therefore, the post Talmudic sages debate whether there is a time frame. So it is very interesting. What you're saying is very true. In the background of our discussion, is the story doesn't tell you a time frame. The story says what Rabbi Nachman said, what the ruling was. Later, the sages say that the post Talmudic sages say, one second, does this happen immediately or do you give the guy some time? And there's a debate. So you see, there's layers of debate. We have the story. We're not. I'm, I'm not even sure exactly what the story, what happened in the story. The story just, is just the general terms. Later, 500 years later, the rabbis in the early commentators that we're talking about in the 11th, 12th, 13th century are trying to figure out: Was there a time frame? Should there be a time frame? So your point, your savara, your logic is sound. So thank you for that. Okay, so let's go to what actually happened. What happened? They came before. The matter came before Rav Nachman one of the Talmudic sages, who said to the Bailey, every circumstance where a Bailey claims, I do not know where I place them, it, it is in, in and of itself negligence. He says, it's not that it got lost. Remember, an unpaid, ba an unpaid Bailey, a Shoy Merchina, someone who's guarding something for free and it gets stolen, doesn't have to pay. If it gets lost in the market, it doesn't have to pay. But here, Rav Nachman says, one second, if you don't remember where you put it, that's negligence. Someone gives you their jewelry, you, and you put it somewhere, it's your obligation to know where it is. If you didn't, if you don't know where it is, you're a paishaya, you, um, you, are, you are negligent, and you're therefore you're responsible to pay. Even an unpaid guardian is responsible to pay in a case of negligence. Now, the guy had no money, didn't have cash to pay for the jewelry. Jewelry could be very expensive. The Bailey did not pay. He didn't have any money or he didn't pay. He didn't want to pay. Rav Nachman went and gave instructions to repossess his palace and sell it to pay for the jewels. The story takes an interesting twist and later in the Talmud, in this page, goes the, the Talmud follows every, every twist and turn of the story. We'll get to, I don't know if we'll get into that, but it's just interesting to see the end of the story because you see the guy was saying the truth. When he said it got lost, he, he, really, he really meant it. Um, ultimately, not only were the jewels found, but they had also increased in value. So this guy was saying the truth. So remember, on the Bailey, Vicky gave me her jewelry. I said, I, I know it's in my house somewhere. I don't know where it is. Wait a minute, wait a little bit. So you went to court, you went to Rav Nachman. Rav Nachman says... What do you mean? If you don't know, somebody gave you something of value and you don't know where it is, that's negligence. I have to pay. I didn't pay. Either I didn't want to or I had no money. I don't know. So they come, they, they repossess my, my palace. I have a summer palace, me and the queen. Um, then later, I, they found, I found the money. But now that same jewelry, the price, the, the value went up. So let's say the, the jewelry was $50,000. So they took my, my, my summer house, which was $50,000. Now I found the jewelry, but now the jewelry is worth 75000 So what do you do? This, this gets into a whole discussion. We're not going to get into it now, but just to trigger the, 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 the question is, do, you, do, I get the, do I give them back the jewelry and I get my house back? And then they, the original owner, keeps the $25,000 increase? Or do you say, once the, um, my house was repossessed to repay, now I keep the jewelry and the price, I keep the jewelry and I get the price increase? 
So what did Rav Nachman say? I'm not, we're not going to get into the, the, the whole discussion about that, but it's just interesting to the story. That's what happened in the story. And it's also interesting to see that the guy was saying the truth. Nevertheless, Rav Nachman said, when I told you, you have to pay, I didn't mean that you're not saying the truth. I said, if you don't know where it is, you are, you are negligent. So let's, let's get to the end of the story. Um, ultimately, not only were the Jews found, but they had also increased in value. Rav Nachman said, the jewels returned to their initial owner and the palace returns to its owner. And the Bailey does not profit from the increase in the value of the jewels. So what happens is I return the jewelry with the increased price to the original owner. I get my house back, which is not simple at all. Usually you would say once you repossess something, it's final. But basically what happens here, the Talmud is going to say, was all predicated on a mistake. I was never, that, that's the difference here. Usually if I owe you money and you repossess, that's it, it's done. But here, the fact that you took away my house was predicated on a mistake because really the the, the object the the um, really really the, the the jewelry was always in my house. I was never obligated to pay in the begin with. So this is we're gonna the Talmud over there and and, and tractate uh, Bab Metzia page thirty five a just got, continues to discuss the story. But I think for our purpose we got in and we got out, and I think for our purpose we got enough on the story. And now we'll see it in 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 in. Uh, Maimonides, and Vicky is right in the sense that, in the sense that um, there's a debate of whether or not you give the guy some time, or do you go to 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 uh, to make the person pay immediately? And some people say you give the person time. Maimonides says there's no time. We'll see in the, in, inside Maimonides, and we'll see what Maimonides sources. But others say no, you give the guy time because other codifiers don't work, don't use that word that Maimonides uses, which is miyad immediately. So give me just one second, I'll find the Maimonides inside, and then everything will be hopefully will be nicer to see. Okay, I don't have it in my notes. We'll open it up one second. Is it because you doubt his sincerity? No, no. It's because it's because I don't think I don't think that's what it is. I think that's, um, I think that the Talmud said Rabbi Nachman says that's the only. Remember, there's no Mishnah. There's some matters of law which are written in the Mishnah, written in the teaching. This wasn't in the teaching. This is a story. We have a story. We don't know why Rabbi Nachman said it. We just know this is what Rabbi Nachman said. There's no earlier source that says this explicitly. But Rabbi Nachman thought, thought about all the knowledge that was at present, and he said, based on all of this, this is my conclusion. And I would imagine, he says, if you don't know, that's negligence. He says, if it was stolen, it's beyond your control. But somebody gives you something, and you forgot. We're not saying you didn't forget. We're not saying you're lying. If we weren't sure if he's lying, we'd make him take an oath or do something else that we try to define whether he's saying the truth. This is not a question of belief. This is a question is we believe you that you don't remember, but it's your responsibility to remember. Somebody gives you something, you know, if, it's, if it was stolen, it's out of your control. But if you forgot, forgot, forgot is negligence. Um, reminds me of uh, when, when the kid comes to school and, and, he says, and he says, I forgot my homework. So I still remember, maybe it's his trauma, maybe any therapy for this. But in the first grade, the teacher says, he says, did you ever forget your pants? And, 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 and the point over there is forgetting your homework is not an excuse. If you say you forgot it, actually you're making the crime bigger. It's saying you don't care about your homework. You're saying it's not important. So that's the same idea. For that teacher, I forgot my homework. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. It doesn't matter if you forgot it. The point is, that's, that, that's the problem. How did you forget your homework? So I guess homework is not as important. But if you're taking somebody else's object, I think it's your responsibility to know where it is. And if you don't, that's okay. But you're negligent. Write it down, something. So, Rabbi. Yes. Let's have a hypothetical. <laughs> I love hypotheticals. <laughs> okay. So, my children are moving to Israel or temporarily. And in Israel, they have a real problem and they want to get a divorce. Come on. Wait, wait. And they gave us their ketubah to hold in our house or wherever. And we can't find it. So that is a very interesting question because, because unlike the jewelry, the ketubah itself is not worth money. It's just testimony about an, a, a financial obligation. Right. So for example, what happens if you give me uh, a document that says 
that somebody owes you a million dollars and I lose the documents, okay? So in one hand, I, did, I make, make you, did, I, did I make you lose any money? No, because I didn't lose your million dollars. What I did is I lost the proof in case the person who owes you a million dollars, in case he denies it. Right. Right. So, so it's a step away. It's not as as we as, as uh, it's not like I actually cause you damage. But I don't remember offhand, so I should I shouldn't talk, but I'll talk anyway. Um, that's called grama. That's called causing a damage. And if you would be liable, which I think you would, it would be, but it would be under the other doctrine, not as. Not, not, not as it would be like causing someone damage indirectly. And under certain circumstances, I could be liable for that as well. But don't I have to present my ketubah in order to get my get? If it I depends. Were Sorry? It, depend, it depends. It depends on, on area. And it depends in, in places where people write ketubah, but they don't write ketubah. It depends. It depends. Oh. It, depend, it depends. In other words, because sometimes in some places, the ketubah is just a proof, but the court would assume that if you were married, you have that you um if you were married that obligation was made and and the husband would have to pay the ketubah so it depends it depends in some places it, it depends the short answer is it depends um nowadays there's so many other proofs that that marriage happened i don't know that you actually have to present the ketubah right if you can prove that you were married um, with a Jewish wedding, if there's a rec record of the of the marriage and the rabbi was there, and you have a video of the wedding, and you know it was an Orthodox wedding, you assume the ketubah was fine and kosher and all good, and mm -hmm. therefore, even if you don't have it, even if you don't have a, the receipt, the ketubah is more like the receipt, you may be able to collect. I don't know the exact law. I don't remember. I don't know. But uh, in some cases, in other words, the, 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 the document is more of a case if somebody denies. In the olden days, there was a, sometimes people people would, would pay back the ketubah. So a woman comes and says, I, I, you know, I was divorced. I want to collect my husband's ketubah. We say, how do we know he didn't pay you yet? Right? So holding the ketubah means I wasn't paid. Because if I was paid, maybe I would give my ketubah back. So the short answer is it depends. That's the short answer. But the point here is, yes, sometimes, even if I lose a document, be it a ketubah or be it a, a, a document, a loan document, mm -hmm. Right? Sometimes, if I would lose that, under, under, uh, I think in many, I think in most cases, I would be responsible. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think that, I think the answer is I would be responsible because I am causing damage indirectly, even though I didn't cause you damage. It's the other party who's denying the fact that they borrowed money and was refusing to pay you back. But but um, but but I, at least I'm part of it because if I held the document, you would have the proof. Mm -hmm. So by that I lost the document or I forget where it is. Uh, in some sense, I am causing damage to you in an indirect way, but it's direct enough to make me liable in many cases. Thanks. Okay, let's look at read Maimonides now for a moment, because Maimonides adds a, adds a word that Vicky touched upon, and we don't know where he got it from. He didn't get it from the story. Actually, he may, he may have gotten it from another Talmudic source. Let's see in a second. There's another story. Okay, let's go to the other story. Let's do that. We'll be fun. So we had that first story with Rav Nachman. Story, the guy gave his friend jewels and he couldn't find it. And Rav Nachman says, you can't find it. You're a Peshea, you are negligent. And therefore he collected the palace. He repossessed the palace. That was that story. That's in Baba Metziah, page 35a. You turn a few pages to 42a and you get it seven pages later and you have another story. What's the other story? Very similar story, short, short and sweet. Not that complicated, not that, that much drama. So let's share the screen and we'll go to the second story. And we'll see, you tell me which story you think Maimonides ruled according to. Very, very similar. So I'm going to 42.2. The Gemara relates there was a certain man who deposited money with another. Eventually, the owner of the money said to the Bailey, give me my money. I gave you, I gave you $50 to hold. And I come back and say, could you please pay me the $50? The Bailey said to him, I do not know where I placed it. The matter came before Rava. Last story was Rav Nachman. It wasn't money, it was jewels. Here it's money, and it was Rava. Also, Rava is most, probably one of the most famous, uh, um, Rabbi and Rava, the most famous, two, two famous Talmudic sages. that are quoted the most in the Talmud. In any case, the matter came before Rava, who said to the Bailey, every circumstance where a Bailey claims I do not know is in, in and of itself negligence. 
go pay. Very similar story, right? So go pay. Okay, this story was never found. Fine. Let's look at Maimonides for a minute. Maimonides says um, seven. So chapter four, the laws of borrowers, chapter four, um, section seven, right here, it's on the screen. Says Maimonides, the following law applies when a person entrusts either articles or money. We had two stories, remember? <laughs> Rav Nachman's story was jewelry. Rava's story was money. Rav, uh, um, Maimonides says both. So he entrusts either articles or money to a colleague. Should the owner demand the, to the, of the watchman, give me my entrusted article, give me the object back. And the watchman tells him, I do not know where I placed the entrusted article, or I do not know where I buried the money. Because we discussed last week or two weeks ago that in those days, money was silver and the best place to hide the money was to bury it and you have to bury it. So he says, I buried it in my backyard. The problem is I live in the suburbs. I have a big backyard. I have no idea where I buried it. So, so, so what is my, wait, I will look for it, find it and return it to you. Now we get Maimonides, Maimonides clarifies the claim. He says, yeah, I'll pay you back. Well, as soon as I find it, wait a few days, I'll find it. Says Maimonides, he is considered negligent and is required to make restitution immediately. Miyad. That's a word that you saw both stories. Bo, you saw the story on page 35a of Rav Nachman, and you saw the story on page 42a of Rava. Both words, both stories is not as strong as Maimonides, right? Maimonides says immediately. He takes a position on this. He says immediately. And people say, one second, where does Maimonides get this immediately from? So of the two stories, it's probably more likely that the second story could be immediately, right? Look at the first story, story of Rav Nachman, right? The story of Rav Nachman, I just opened the screen. He says, every circumstance where a claims I do not know where I placed them, is in of itself, like this, go pay. Zil Shlim. Actually, both are the same, maybe. The bottom line is, the commentaries say, 42 also. Rabbi, say, Hasha, um, Rabbi says, Zil Shlim, go pay. So the commentaries say that when it says the story, Zil Shlim, go pay. So we just Maimonides say to get the word immediately. So what the commentaries say, one second. Because the Talmud doesn't say, um, because the Talmud doesn't say, doesn't give a time frame. So obviously go pay means immediately. If it meant in a month, it would say a month. So that's how Maimonides says. Maimonides says you have to pay immediately. There's no monkey business. There's no, I can't find you. Come back tomorrow. I'll pay you back tomorrow. You'll keep me on the run forever. However, the other codifiers, the Rush, the Rif, the other codifiers of, of the Talmud, they quote this story. They quote this law, but they don't write that word miyad. They don't write the word immediately. And therefore, some people say that the court has to give a reasonable amount of time. So there's a debate. The debate is how, how immediately they have to pay. Okay, that is the um, that is this this piece. Um, I, we, go ahead. Yeah, the second story is more time sensitive because while they were debating, the jewels went up in price. Right, because you have to understand. And also, that, can that complicates the matter? But the first story is just straightforward. You have to pay immediately. Right, right. I would say, I would just say that I could push back and say that the time has to lapse. To repossess a home takes time. There's a whole system in the Talmud, how you evaluate the home and how you uh, announce maybe there's a buyer. I think it takes 90 days or at least there's going to be time to repossess a home doesn't happen overnight. So it could be Rav Nachman said he gave the verdict, you have to pay right away, right? But because there was no money, so they had to sell the palace. So time elapsed. And in between, the value of the silver of, of the jewelry changed. But that, that's a technicality, the time passed. But that doesn't mean to say that Rav Nachman gave, him a, a, gave the guy a time, time for him to pay. He may have, may have not, right? So it's just interesting that the post-Talmudic codifiers, remember, there's no mission about this. All we have is these two stories. For this law, the only source, of, the only source is these two stories. So we don't exactly know what happened in that story. So we don't exactly know what the law is. And therefore there's a debate that Maimonides is, is like, it, as is his custom, he's very clear and very sharp. And he adds the word miyat immediately. There's no monkey business. There's no um, vagueness. The other commentaries, they sort of quote the Talmud language. They don't add that word immediately. So you could argue that maybe they meant what the Talmud means. Maybe it means immediately, but others say, um, 
The others say, no, no, no. If they didn't write immediately, you have to be reasonable. And that's what Vicky said in the beginning, which is give the guy a little breathing space. Maybe give him a week. Maybe he'll hire, hire some help uh, to come look for it. Give the guy some breathing space. So that's the debate, whether or not you give the guy breathing space. We're based on the Talmud. So, and again, the Talmud is not clear on this question. So uh, you have the, this, this divergence between Nonmanides, who says immediately, and others who are not as strong and say, look, you got to give the guy a little bit of time. How much time? Depends on, on the circumstances. And therefore, there's no set, set amount. Let the court decide. So that is um, that little section. We, le we learned one full section. We could stop here. We could start a new section, or we can go a little bit deeper. I want to go a little bit deeper. Remember that, as I mentioned in the beginning, when you look at, well, I remember in the, when we were in yeshiva, in, the, in the grade school, we, 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 you, you basically had the four guardians. You had a chart, the four guardians. And on top, you had the different types of claims that was lost, that was stolen, uh, died while it was doing the work, out of my control. You had, you, so you have the, 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 and then you would make the chart and figure out, depending on which guardian, and figure out what happened, what was the damage. Okay. The problem is that this case does not, I forgot where I put it, it's not on any of the charts. Like I mentioned, it, does, it doesn't say it any, any of the charts. It doesn't, say, it doesn't say it in the Mishnah. So nobody knows exactly. Um, nobody knows exactly uh, um, what, uh, basically under what doctrine are you making this guy guilty? You're making this guy has to pay, the Bailey has to pay. So I just want to say how 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 show how we can get a little a little you can get you can get a, you can get a little a little you can get some analysis going here, and you can get a chakira you can get a, two ways of looking at the matter and you can get a conclusion. So the simple interpretation is some people say well we're billing you under the doctrine of a guardian you are a guardian, and you're negligent you forgot you're negligent that's what it seems that the Talmud is saying. But others say one second slow it down, you're not really negligent because you did everything you were supposed to do. Someone gave you money or jewelry and you hid it very well. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to hide it in the ground. You hid it very well. You hid it so well that you can't find it. So wonderful. So you're gonna say I'm negligent. It wasn't lost, it wasn't stolen. I mean, it was, it was lost means it's off my property. It wasn't, it didn't lose it in the marketplace. I didn't lose it on Greenwich Avenue. It wasn't stolen. A hurricane came, but this is still safe because it's under the ground. I did everything right. What are you talking about? I'm negligent. I'm not negligent under the doctrine of the bailee, of the guardian, because I did everything the guardian was supposed to do. That's, 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 what, that's one commentary. Um, so this commentary says one second. He says that you're not obligated under the doctrine of the bailee. Instead, you're, this is a commentary of the Code of Law. He says, this bailee is... This bailey is obligated under the doctrine of torts, of damaging. I took your jewelry and I placed it in a place where nobody could find it. I damaged your property. I'm not under the bailey. I did nothing wrong. I did exactly what I was supposed to do. But he says the laws of bailey. Look through the laws of bailey. There's no such. There's no such sort of damage. You hit it so well that nobody can find it. You'll get a medal under the laws of bailey. You get a medal. But what happens here is, here it was the case of, here it's, we, we consider this damage and um, um, I hid your item to the extent that I can't find it, nobody can find it, I damaged you. Um, this is the laws of torts. Okay, you're sitting, what's the difference? We're sitting 10.34 in the morning. The rabbis don't have anything to do with their time other than debate whether the fact that I have to pay you is under the doctrine of um, Bailey or under the doctrine of torts, who cares? The answer is there's a lot of differences. There are a lot of differences. And let's play them out. I'll give you just one. There are many cases where even a, a Bailey, a guardian, is not obligated to pay even if he's negligent. For example, we said a case earlier, we discussed this in the past, that for whatever reason, which we're not going to go into now because we weren't sure about what the reason was now, so I'm not going to go into it now. Then we weren't sure. Now it's, we're not going to bring up that whole thing. But the Torah says that if I borrow something and the owner is there, no matter what happens, if the owner is there uh, and, and then something goes wrong, I'm not responsible because the owner was there. So if I borrow your item 
and you're right there, you're in the other room, you're present. And we said it means if you're working for me without the, the in, other, in other words, it's not very difficult to find a case where the Bailey is not obligated for negligence. So the Nesiva Samishpat says, the commentary says one second, stop a second. If you're going to say that I hit it and I can't remember where I hit it, that's considered negligence under the laws of Bailey, then in those cases where the Bailey is not obligated for negligence, because the owner is there, for example, then he wouldn't have to pay. But if you're going to say I'm obligated to pay because it's considered torts, I damaged you, I took your jewelry and I put it in a place where I can't remember it, that's considered damage. Damage, you're always obligated to pay. So we're not just sitting on wasting our time trying to figure out under what doctrine I am obligated to pay for the object that I hit and I don't know where I found it. But, but, but um, uh, um, it is very important to figure out what, under what doctrine because on the extremes, many, most cases, you have to pay. It doesn't make a difference if I'm paying under Bailey or I'm paying under, under doctrine of, of torts. But on the extremes, there are cases where the Bailey is not obligated for, for um, negligence, but for torts, you would be obligated to damage somebody else. If I damage you with my hands, I'm always obligated. So that's why the Nesivus Mishpat says, no, this case that of Rav Nachman and Rava, they were not relying on the laws of Bailey. And the laws of Bailey, I did a great job. I hid the item so well. So why am I obligated? Because I damaged you. How did I damage you? I took something of value that belongs to you and I placed it in a place that nobody can find it. So that's the story in short. To summarize, we had the case of so the two cases. We are, I'm, I'm the Bailey, I, I'm the guardian. You come to me and you say, could you please guard your object? And I say, yes. And I did a great job. Nobody took it. Nobody stole it. It's all fine. I just can't remember where I put it. The, 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 the law, and on the, both those stories, both Rav Nachman and Rava, the law would be, I have to pay. Later, we said there's a post-Tamburic debate, whether I have to pay immediately or they give me some leeway. Maimonides says it immediately. Others argue, maybe, yeah, maybe no. Others argue that the Rif and the Rosh and others would say it doesn't mean immediately because they didn't write the word immediately. So I'm not sure what they meant, but at least some people say they have not meant it Im immediately. So that was the first point. And the second point of the post on discussion is under what doctrine am I, do I have to pay when I say I don't remember? Is it under negligence under the laws of the Bailey? Or is it that I'm actually, I damaged you? And if I damaged you, I have to pay in all circumstances. In other words, torts. I took your object and I put it in a place that cannot be found. It's not Bailey. It's, neg it's, it's not Bailey. It's, it, 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 it's damage. And if I damaged you, I always have to pay no matter what, even if the owner is there, even in all cases. And that would be the distinction. It reminds me of the story uh, that ever we talk about the, the, uh, the uh, exile. And the, the, the Hasidim would say that the purpose of exile, Moshe says, Moshe defined, Moses in the Torah defines the exile as God says, I'm going to hide my face. I'm going to hide. So the Hasidim say, what, why is God hiding? God hides because God wants you to search for him. And it's a story. It's a story is if, if a father wants to play hide and seek. Why do you hide and seek? Because you don't want to see your son? No. You hide to see how much your son loves you and how much of whether the son is going to come and look for you. Hide and seek. Problem is, says the Rebbe, sometimes... The father hides in a place that's such a good hiding place that the kid is playing hide and seek, but then he gives up. <laughs> this is enough already. So that's not the game. You, the, the, the father defeated the purpose. You got to come out of your hiding place because the whole purpose of the game is if your son is looking for you. But if your son stopped looking, you got to come out of the hiding place. And that's what the Rebbe said to God. I mean, you hid. You did a very good job. You hid the money, but now you can't find it. Or now we can't find it. So now, now you have to come out and, uh, and reunite. So that's what this reminds me of, but uh, just going from topic to topic. So thank you for joining. This has been fun, a very short law, but you see how many layers you have. You have the question, you have a Talmudic story, then you have at least two layers of analysis post-Talmud to figure out what exactly is the ramifications of this law, what are the definitions, is it immediately, is it not immediately, does it apply, is it based on the laws of torts? based on the laws of the Bailey, and therefore it only applies in certain cases, or is it based on my obligated on the, on the laws of torts, of damages, and therefore it would apply in every single case. So that's the story. In short, thank you all.